field that is being used as a replacement for animal therapy in nursing homes, which is really kind of awesome. So she builds planets on Earth, you guys. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Lee and Niall Albright Annual Symposium, Give Black Scientists a Place in This Fight, COVID-19 and the Racial Divide. I'm James Wetzel. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I am the producer of adult programs at the Museum of Science, Boston. I'm coming to you live from our Suit Cabot studio, and I am incredibly excited and honored to introduce our guests this evening and this important conversation. Adrian Gladden Young is a senior research associate at the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard. Uh, she has spent her career studying infectious disease outbreaks, including the current COVID-19 pandemic that is affecting all of us. However, it is a reality that the virus is disproportionately affecting the black community due to systemic racism that is ingrained in our nation, our processes, and the health and medical establishments. This summer, Adrian published an incredible piece in The Atlantic calling out the reasons how and why racism is allowing the black community to remain vulnerable to the virus and why it is crucial that the health establishment not only provides a space at the table for black scientists, but allows them to lead the charge against COVID. I am incredibly honored tonight that Adrian has agreed to be here and allow us to amplify her words and her research and the necessity to give black scientists a place in this fight. And tonight is a part of our current virtual fall season of adult programming. We have an incredible lineup of free virtual events that'll happen every week through the end of the year, including a very special symposium with Professor Ibram X. Kendi on October 14th. And you can check out that full lineup by going to mos.org adults. You can register for your spot in all those events and make sure while you're there to sign up for our email list so that you can stay up to date on everything happening here at the museum for adults, just like tonight's event. I will be back a little bit later on for a Q&A with Adrian. So as questions come to mind tonight, you can submit those at any point starting right now by going to slido.com and entering the code Adrian Gladden Young. That's all one word, Adrian Gladden Young. And once again, uh, that website is slido, S-L-I-D-O.com. And we'll try and get through as many of those as we can a little bit later on. I need to thank two very important people without whom tonight would not be possible. Uh, that, of course, is Lee and Niall Albright. We thank you for your continued support of the adult programming here at the museum. For over a decade, the Albrights have supported our work through this ongoing symposium, allowing us to highlight work from incredible individuals, and tonight is no exception. So, Lee and Niall, we thank you. We hope you're out there watching, and we hope we can see you soon. Uh, and finally, after the talk tonight, I ask all of you to go to donate.mos.org slash MOS at home and make a gift to allow us to keep bringing free virtual STEM experiences into your homes just like tonight. Once again, that's donate.mos.org slash MOS at home. But now it is my privilege to welcome to your screens our guests this evening. Please join me in welcoming Adrian Gladden Young. Take it away, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Good evening, um, everyone. I'm so honored to be a part of this symposium. Thank you so much to the Albrights for the opportun uh, opportunity and to James, thank you so much for the invitation um, to share with everyone some of the work that we've been doing in the lab to understand the epidemiology of COVID-19. As of today, um, the United States has confirmed the most COVID-19 cases in the world. That's 7 million confirmed cases and more than 200,000 lives lost since January. And just shortly after the WHO declared um, the coronavirus outbreak a global pandemic, it became apparent that the virus was affecting certain ethnic and racial populations in America in disparate ways. And by now, you know, most of you know, uh, most of us know that the black, brown, and indigenous populations have been infected and killed by COVID-19 more than any other group. And black people in America account for more than 20% of all COVID-19 deaths. Now, as a scientist, I want to know why, how is this virus disproportionately killing and infecting black people? Viruses don't discriminate. 
If they can infect, they will. Um, but as a Black person, I know from personal experience how these disparities are created. The Black population has been made vulnerable in many ways by discriminatory American systems, including the health establishment. And because of this, our communities have been hit hardest. And so as I was working late nights and into the wee hours of the mornings in the lab, I came to realize just how significant my role as a Black scientist is in addressing these disparities. Next slide. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about me and how I first became interested in infectious diseases and health disparities. I was born and raised in Springfield, Massachusetts, called the City of First. Um, and it's the birthplace of Dr. Seuss. It's the home of the Basketball Hall of Fame. As a matter of fact, I grew up right down the street from Springfield College where basketball was invented. And Springfield has the second largest Black population in Massachusetts, only second to Boston. And when I grew up, I, I lived in a predominantly Black neighborhood. It was a, a close-knit community, more like a family, really. Next slide. And this is me uh, when I was six years old. <laughs> and when I was young, all of us neighborhood kids would play outside together almost every day. We couldn't wait to get home from school, to change out of our corduroys and into our play clothes, as we used to call them. And we would play kickball, jump rope, hopscotch, tag, hide and go seek. We'd ride our bikes and race down the street. And we always had fun together. The next door neighbor, uh, she used to braid my hair in cornrows. And it was nothing to get a knock on the door asking to borrow a cup of sugar or returning some eggs that had been lent out the day before. And the adults in the neighborhood, they always looked out for us. It was truly a village. And I remember this one neighbor. Uh, he was a, a Black man. He was tall and slender. And he was very playful. He would often be around us to, to throw a ball uh, to us or chase us when we were playing tag. And he told me that I was his favorite because we shared the same birthday. So I loved the times when he played with us. But, but I also remember the times that he wouldn't play with us. Some days he'd be sitting on his front porch far away from us drinking from this brown paper bag. I hated that brown paper bag. I didn't even know what he was drinking from that bag. It must have been something pink because it turned the inside of his lip pink and blotchy. But that brown paper bag kept him away from us. And then I remember those times when he disappeared for days and I didn't know where he was. Eventually, uh, usually he'd, always, he'd usually come back. And when he did, he would play with us again until this one time. And I remember that, that, there, that, that day like it was yesterday. This one time he disappeared and he never came back. I remember that day, that day that I found out that he was never coming back. I was six years old and this is in the late eighties. And I asked my parents what happened to him? Where is he? And my dad told me that he, our neighbor had been very sick and that he died from complications due to AIDS. And I had no clue what AIDS was, but I knew that I didn't like what it had done to my favorite neighbor. And I remember my dad saying, you know, I don't know much about AIDS, but I'm sure that you can find the cure for it. And so at the age of six, I was convinced that I was going to grow up and find a cure for AIDS. What I didn't realize was that at that time, I had an insider's view of what was happening around the world and how it was disproportionately affecting Black communities just like mine. This is in the, the 80s when AIDS was first discovered. And by the time the first cases were discovered, more than a quarter of a million people were already infected with HIV. And Black people made up half of the AIDS cases in America. And what's even worse is that the situation hasn't improved much since that time. Now Black people who make up just 13% of the population in the United States account for 44% of HIV infections. And so I set out on my mission uh, when I was six years old to cure AIDS, to solve this problem. And I even studied um, HIV in an academic lab for, for uh, seven years after undergrad. Um, next slide. And then in 2013, I joined um, Dr. Pardis Tibeti's lab where we worked to optimize methods to conduct viral genomic studies. 
And through this work, we were able to, we've been able to track and trace um, the spread of viruses responsible for some of the deadliest infectious disease outbreaks in history, like the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, the 2016 Zika outbreak in the Americas, and now this COVID-19 pandemic. So what you might be wondering is, what are viral genomic studies or what's viral genomic sequencing? Well, I'm sure most of you um, know what DNA is and that it encodes our genes. We love to say it's in my genes, it's it's in my DNA, um, or we often attribute some traits or physical characteristics to genes that we've inherited. Well, our genome, our DNA, is a collection of all of our genes and other information that we need to live in, and reproduce. And viruses have genes too. And their genetic material also holds the information needed for their survival and replication. And so a virus genome sequence is just the readout, like the sequence of letters um, that you see in the background of this slide that reveals uh, this valuable information about the virus. Next slide. So when the first cases of pneumonia um, caused by an unknown virus were identified last December, the virus was extracted from patient clinical samples and the genomes were sequenced. And then the sequence was compared to known genomic sequences of other viruses. And the sequence uh, was found to be very similar to that of a bat SARS-like coronavirus. And so it was named SARS coronavirus 2, AKA coronavirus. No doubt by that time, um, by the time the first cases were identified, hundreds had probably already been infected, but their cases were either undetected or mischaracterized. Next slide. And so um, identifying this virus and sequencing its genome is valuable for detection and for correct diagnosis, treatment, and even prevention of infections. So for example, I'm sure uh, most of us have either been tested by now, or at least heard of the, the different diagnostic tests for COVID-19. Well, actually most or all of them um, involve searching for parts or all of the virus genome sequence and test samples like the nasal swab samples that are collected. And I think most of us will, will agree that diagnostic testing has proven to be important for containing the spread of this virus. Um, but while diagnostic tests are extremely valuable, they're really only useful if they're equally and, and easily accessible. And we know that testing was not or is not equally accessible to everyone. First, the testing criteria was biased towards international travelers early on. And when testing finally became more widely available in the US, it still wasn't accessible to everyone. In fact, uh, results from a study that was conduct conducted by a company in Boston showed that doctors and healthcare providers were less likely to refer their Black patients for testing, even when they had symptoms of COVID. And so, next slide. And so maybe you can start to think about how that might affect our ability to track in, um, the spread of this virus. If we, can, if we can find and sequence the virus genomes that are present in samples, we can start to understand how and where the virus is moving and spreading. And we can look for specific parts of that sequence, certain like signatures within the sequences that allows us to define different kinds or strains of this virus. And if we can follow these signatures, we can link different cases together by matching the signatures. Or we could also uh, follow the paths of these strains and identify hotspots along the way. But in order to accurately track, trace, and connect different cases, it's essential that these genome sequences be evenly represented. And so, next slide. And so we sought to learn um, about the ways that the virus was being introduced um, and spreading in Massachusetts and more specifically in the Boston area. In, in Massachusetts, um, as of now, there have been more than 125,000 COVID-19 confirmed cases and more than 9,000 deaths. And during the time of our study period in, in, in Boston, almost 42% of the COVID-19 cases where race or ethnicity were known were Black residents. Um, 
we did our work in collaboration with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and Massachusetts General Hospital and, and other partners. And we attempted to sequence virus genomes from samples representing more than a thousand COVID-19 cases in Massachusetts, which included the first and nearly all of the earliest confirmed COVID-19 cases in Massachusetts. Next slide. So we sequenced um, almost 800 virus genomes. And in our data set, we found that um, different strains of the virus have been imported from four different continents. Um, and and, and most, of, most of the uh, virus genome sequences were closely related to the strains found in Europe, New York, and other parts of the United States. The virus we found was repeatedly introduced or brought into Boston at least 80 different times um, through people who were already infected when they came in, into the area. And you can see here on this map, thank you, um, all of the virus genomes that we sequenced and others that were sequenced in North America um, and in other continents, you can see how the virus traveled around the world. We also um, found that super spreading events played a significant role in continuing the spread of the virus in the Boston area. You've probably heard of super spreading by now, but the term describes instances when one person, one infected person transmits the virus to an abnormally large number of people. And so I'm going to describe two super spreading events that we characterized um, in this study. Next slide. So the first took place um, at an international were connected by a common source. So indeed, um, there was a super spreading event at this, um, at this conference. And we were also able to trace uh, a specific virus strain that we had found um, and, and found that it continued to spread even weeks after the conference in different populations and communities in the Boston area and, and other states um, and on different, um, to different continents. N next slide. The other super spreading event um, happened in early April, I believe, in a skilled nursing facility near Boston, shortly before residents um, of the facility were suppo supposed to be moving to a different location. I think there were almost 100 residents. They're all older in age. Uh, median age was um, 84 years. And many of them had pre-existing health conditions, and they were tested for the coronavirus just as a precaution before relocating them. There was no COVID-19 suspected, um, as neither the residents nor the staff had reported any symptoms before they were tested. But over a few days of testing, 85% um, of the residents and 37% um, of the staff tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, sadly, 24 of the residents who tested positive died within two weeks. Um, and so we, we sequenced um, most of the virus genomes from, from this group and found multiple strains of the virus, probably indicating that there were several people who were infected before going into this nursing facility. But we also found that 59, 59 of the virus genomes uh, that we sequenced were identical to each other, indicating that all of these infections, 59 different people infected, were infected by one single source. And so you can see how easily uh, one infection can lead to so many um, 
especially in those who have been made vulnerable. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me, next slide. It's actually, um, oof, it's been quite disturbing to think about how certain populations have been made so vulnerable to COVID-19. Think about who was getting tested, who was getting treated, and then think about who was neglected or who was forgotten. Next slide. And then you can start to consider um, my examples of super spreading in the context of these inequities. And so since I was already talking about Boston, I'll just use Boston as an example for a minute. Um, but this situation is in no way unique to Boston. We've seen this scenario play out, especially in major cities all, all throughout this country. Um, but for a minute, just go with me into one of the predominantly Black neighborhoods in Boston, maybe Roxbury, uh, Mattapan, or Dorchester. And of course, there are others, but these neighborhoods remind me of home. So imagine that a, a Black resident there is sick and experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, maybe a fever, an uncontrollable cough, or maybe they've developed pneumonia by this time. And they go to see their primary care doctor, if they have one, and the doctor tries to convince them that they couldn't possibly have COVID-19, and so they don't qualify for a test. That wouldn't be anything new anyways, because the health establishment has historically minimized the pain and suffering of Black people, and their complaints, our complaints, are often ignored and not taken seriously. We've been led to believe this centuries-old myth that we as Black people are somehow resistant to diseases like COVID-19 or AIDS or yellow fever. And so this person... Um, maybe they're actually convinced that they can't get COVID. And so they might go back into their community and convince others that Black people can't get COVID-19. Or, or instead, they might go to a community um, clinic or healthcare center. Maybe it's closer to home for them. Um, but unfortunately, because tests and other supplies are not equally distributed, these community centers are last to receive much needed resources. And so since testing isn't available there, they still can't get tested. And now, since we know how easily this coronavirus can spread, this person may spread it to others without even knowing it, especially if they're in close contact with others, like maybe on a subway train or a bus, because everyone in Boston rides the T. Um, and so even more cases will go undetected. Um, and not being able to detect cases um, will cause more time to pass before people can get medical care, and it will limit their options for the care that they will need to survive. And so the virus will silently invade this community, and it will become a hot spot, but no one will even know it. In this community, they'll not, they won't even be able to benefit from healthcare effort, uh, public health um, efforts. Sometimes, um, sometimes community health centers aren't even partnered with institutions like many of the top ranked research hospitals in Boston, whether their cases are detected or not. And so they can't even benefit from the ongoing research that's happening right in their own backyards. Next slide. And so you can, you can see how racial disparities are created. They exist at every level testing, treatment, research. And since everything is interconnected, inequities in one area means inequities in every area. And that means by the time that these disparities are, were finally realized, the Black population and others had already been hit hardest and had suffered more than any other group. It means that when we ask why the Black population has been infected and killed by COVID-19 more than other population, population's Black race is sure to be blamed. It means that a United States senator gets to publicly speculate that maybe coloreds just aren't washing their hands as well as everyone else. Or maybe they're not wearing masks or socially distancing. Next slide. I mean, even science continues to tell us that our Blackness is a risk factor and that we, our, our Black bodies, are somehow inherently flawed. And that has caused this disproportionate burden of disease. Next slide. 
take for instance, I don't know if you can see it very well, but take for instance, this research study that was published just uh, a few weeks ago that evaluated symptoms and behaviors of a half million participants in the United States to determine risk factors for testing positive for COVID-19. More than 75% of the study participants were white, and the other 25% were classified as African-American, even though I think they meant Black, Latinx, Asian, multiracial, and other combined. And the study concluded that for the majority of the study subjects, risk factors included experiencing common symptoms like loss of taste and smell, cough and fever, and exposure risks like overexposure to the virus as in healthcare workers or exposure in densely populated areas, all of which seem scientifically sound to me. But then there's this ex assignment of risk um, to race or ethnicity for Black and Latinx participants who made up around just probably about 10% of the study group. There was no other demographic category, including income, that was shown to be a risk factor. And yet, once again, science is used, um, used to imply that there's something different, something defective with all Black bodies that must increase their susceptibility to infection. And this is just one of many research studies that chose to stop at race when it's Black and decided that no other research was needed to determine true and biological risk factors. It's, it's unfortunate. Um, that that when Black people are actually uh, uh, become visible or included in, in research, they still can't benefit from it. And, you know, I can't help but think how different this could be if Black scientists, um, people who have lived experiences and insider views to help shape the ways that they, they we understand these populations could be leading these efforts. Um, but we're often not represented, or at least uh, we're underrepresented in these fields because we are no more immune to systemic racism than anyone else in our communities or population. Next slide. So like me, when I was six years old, there are many Black children who want to assume their place in this fight. But of course, there are barriers that block aspiring Black scientists at each step in the pipeline. Several recent um, studies showed how stereotypes and role models significantly affect career aspirations and achieve, achievements in students. And so young kids, they see these stereotypical images of doctors or scientists, for example, and they decide um, at, at seven years of age whether or not they can see themselves in certain career positions. Next. And by high school, teachers and educators in specific fields significantly influence our career paths. For example, the lack of Black female educators discourages Black female students from pursuing careers in the field. Next. And, and therefore, only 5% of Black females end up earning degrees in STEM. And not to mention the other challenges that we face as college, college or graduate students. Often we aren't afforded the same opportunities as everyone else, or sometimes we're just trying to survive in environments that are racist, unsupportive, and unwelcoming. And if we are accepted in these places, we're often made to feel like, like we don't belong there or that we didn't deserve the right to be there. Just consider the extremely low number of Black students at many college and, um, colleges and universities or how um, historically Black colleges and universities um, that do support us often don't get the funding um, and support that they need. Next. So by the time um, we're scientists, we're often the only or, or one of very few on teams that may or may not welcome us, but they often see us as being exceptional. I can't tell you how many times I've been told that I'm not like the rest of them meaning other Black people, as if to imply that that most Black people wouldn't be qualified or able to earn the right to be in the same position. Actually, I remember this this one time I was working in the lab with somebody and um, they explicitly stated this to me. I was working full time in the lab and I was working on a master's degree at the same time and I knew how well I was performing in that program. But this person randomly walks up to me while I'm working in the lab and tells me that they wish they were me. I'm like, wait, sorry, what? 
<laughs> they said they wish they were me, a black female, um, because they were applying to medical school and the admissions process was so competitive. Um, but I, as a black female, I would almost certainly be accepted um, into medical school because the schools always lower their standards to accept people like me. And I think I think maybe, you know, it's maybe it's time for these admissions boards to rethink what they consider to be uh, valuable or appropriate qualifications for acceptance into these into these programs. But that's a discussion for another symposium. Um, next. So so anyway, we're doing work in our fields, uh, maybe conducting research in labs, uh, for example, and we're more likely than anyone else to be interested in research topics on community health or health disparities, you know, things that might affect us personally or uh, people that we're connected to. But this type of research is less likely to be funded. And so it often means that we aren't making the, the unique contributions to this work that are valuable and necessary. And so I remember early, in early March, um, I had gotten a text message, it was like two o'clock in the morning, and I had gotten a text message about this group of um, leaders. I think there were eight um, leaders. They're all a part of this religious organization that I'm affiliated with. And they all uh, lived in the same state and they all had COVID-19. And... Um, Apparently, they had a, um, a, attended the same gathering. I think um, by the time I had found out about it, um, some of them had already, some of them had already died, and I think all or most of them ended up um, dying from from COVID nineteen. Um, the organization that they're affiliated with has tens of thousands of predominantly Black churches in the U.S. and worldwide. And um, what I like about the um, the black churches that it, it represents, um, the black population in that there are people from all different backgrounds, um, all different ages, all different, uh, in earning, earning and income levels, all different, um, just all different backgrounds. Maybe they're all black, but they're not all African-American. Um, and they all come together and they're part of this, this community. They make up this this community, um, and I remember um, hearing about these these eight leaders who had attended this this gathering, and they were all sick. And I remember saying, "Oh my goodness, these churches are going to become hotspots. These gatherings will will for sure turn into super spreading events." And so I started contacting my family, friends, even the author of of this article, um, to warn Black churchgoers to steer clear of these types of gatherings. And I even made contact with with the director of, of health and human services in the state where these um, eight leaders live. And I found out that the state lab would be doing viral genomic sequencing, too. And so I was excited because I knew that I would be able to help with the science and social aspects. And so I I, I um, talked with the director and, and the team and and told them about my affiliation um, with this religious organization. And I told them that I had started compiling a list of all those who were affected by um, the super spreading events at churches in that state and others um, in that state. And um, I think there, there were maybe three super spreading events and hundreds of people were, um, were affected. And I think my list included um, almost 50, 50 deaths. Um, and, and so I sent this, um, this spreadsheet to, to the director. And, you know, I had done all the contact tracing for them, identified hotspots and everything. And you know what? I didn't get a single response back. I didn't get a single response. Um, you know, it, it was just, it was just amazing to me. Um, because, you know, like this, these, these, um, these communities, you know, they, they couldn't have been more diverse, but yet they were affected in the same way. And unfortunately, as the weeks passed, I kept hearing more and more reports and news about super spreading events happening in these predominantly black churches. I can think of at least seven um, of these events right now, though I know there were there were so many more. And so and so I remember um, a month ago or a little over a month ago, I read this study 
that observed just how much super spreading events were contributing to the spread of this virus around the world. And there were more than 1,400 super spreading events that were listed, including at least one of them in, in Boston that we had characterized. And I looked to see if any of these Black church super spreaders were listed. And just one, just one of at least the seven that I, I can think of right now, just one was listed out of more than 1,400 super spreading events from around the world, just one in the, in this, this, um, these, among these black communities uh, was listed. And I remember thinking, next slide, wow, <laughs> we really are invisible. Next. And, you know, when we're noticed, next, um, we're blamed or our blackness is blamed. Just look at this, this image. Um, from a public health department's campaign to stop the, the spread of COVID-19. We don't even have the dignity of being victims like everyone else. We're seen as vectors spreading the disease. I mean, can we even trust science? Next slide. How can we be confident that it will serve us and that we'll be able to benefit from it? There's been a lot of talk recently um, about how many Black people don't actually trust the medical and science institutions, especially as um, vaccine clinical trials are now underway. And oftentimes the Tuskegee syphilis um, study is cited as a reason for that mistrust. Now, to be clear, it was neither the first uh, nor the last of these instances of abuse um, by the scientific and, and medical agencies against Black people, but it's probably um, referenced the most. And so um, this was a study that happened over the course of 40 years and it ended in 1972. There were um, 600 Black men who were, um, who were sharecroppers that were recruited from Macon County in Alabama to be experimental subjects for this study. Since the prevalence of syphilis was was high in that count, um, county at the time, these men were recruited so that researchers could observe the course of the disease specifically in black men and their in their contacts. And so these men were told that they would receive treatment for the disease, but they never did. In fact, even after treatment became available a few years into the study, it was hidden from them. And when the study was closed, all of this was made public. And sometime later, the affected families received uh, restitution for the harm done to them. Honestly, that would have been enough for me to be wary of scientists and science. But I want to point out to you the Black woman in this picture um, who's in the background. And this this picture is, is symbolic to me because I can't, I can't um, help but think that maybe um, this is how she saw her role as one just in the background of this study. Um, she seems to be very familiar with the men uh, who, who look to be waiting, maybe waiting to be examined or treated by, by this uh, white researcher. And she is Eunice Rivers Lurie, a nurse who had traveled around the same county doing public health work for probably about a decade before she was asked to join this study as a researcher. And one of the doctors on the team even remarked that she knew more about public health than any of them. And so she was asked to join the study so she could gain the trust of the community because it, the people, already knew her and she knew them. And some of the, the study participants even noted that there were people in the community who wouldn't open their doors to any other outsiders except Ms. Rivers, as, as people in the community called her. And oftentimes, you know, black scientists, we as black scientists may see um, our role um, as, you know, um, or our job as, um, you know, just trying to earn the trust, um, getting our communities to trust in science. Maybe we see ourselves in a position um, to bridge the gaps um, between our communities and in the science world. And I believe that that is somewhat true. But I've come to realize that our roles extend beyond that because Miss Rivers, and maybe she didn't even recognize her true role, but Miss Rivers, when she was interviewed a couple of years after the study um, had ended, she talked about things from her perspective. She knew that the men wouldn't receive treatment for their syphilis, but she had been convinced by the team of researchers who were white that black people didn't suffer as much as their white counterparts. And that does that the disease um, syphilis always presented in a milder form in black people. Sound familiar? Um, and so 
she was okay with them not being treated because uh, she was also led to believe that the syphilis, their syphilis was in late stage um, in, in these black uh, study participants. And so no treatment would have helped them by that point anyways. Instead, though, she was trying to ensure that by enrolling these men into the study, they would get medical treatment that they would not otherwise get. To her, there was more benefit than abuse in this study. And in my opinion, in my opinion, though, I think about it and I think, you know, it was her job. It's our job to empower the people in our communities and, and, and make sure that that we're a part of, um, you know, a partnership. We have to empower the people in these com- the the communities that we're part of, the communities that we serve. You know, she could have leveraged her close relationships with them to get their involvement or or their input in their own health and care. You know, it's our responsibility to be honest because we're trained and we're knowledgeable, just as she was about public health, science, medicine, and so we can assess when things are right and when they're not. And so we have a responsibility to the fields that we work in to make them the best that they can be. Because science isn't science if it's not for everyone. We need to make sure that that we can work together in this fight, next slide, not only against infectious diseases um, and health disparities, but racist science, so that we can ensure um, the health and livelihood of our communities and everyone. It's our role our position, our position is extremely important and we should be at the front leading the way. Next slide. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge, um, well, everyone listed here, um, but I also want to acknowledge um, Dr. Party Sabeti and, and the Broad Institute um, and to all of the partners who, um, and collaborators who um, participated in in the work that we were doing. Um, and of course, to the Museum of Science, um, um, thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to be a part of this um, discussion tonight. Thank you. Now, I think I think we're we're ready for a Q and A session. We are. Hello, Adrian. Thank you so much uh, for again for being here and for that incredible talk. Uh, it was eye-opening and insightful and important, just like the, your amazing article in The Atlantic, which I, I encourage everyone out there, if you have not already, go out and, and Google that and read it. Um, I believe it came out in, in June or July it was published. June. Yes. Uh, so we, we're just so appreciative to have you here. Um, and uh, I think we're going to jump into some questions. But before I do, just a reminder, if you have a question for Adrian, uh, now is your chance to submit those. You can do so by going to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter the code Adrian Gladden Young, all one word. And we'll try and get through uh, as many of those as we can. So we're going to start um, with, with an easy one, Adrian, I hope at least. Uh, so apart from your areas of expertise, uh, epidemiology, genetics, biotech, what other STEM subjects or fields interest you the most? Or would you have liked to pursue a research career in? You know, um, since I was six years old, I've, al- I've always been interested in infectious disease research. Um, and so that's, 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 that's where my, that's what I'm passionate about. That's where my heart is. Um, Great. So I have to say, I have to say, I'm doing what what I what I love to do. That's amazing. That's amazing, and 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 we're so happy that you are doing it, um, and and helping to change the world. So a next question: uh, Do you have advice for science teachers who want to teach students about this reality and still end the conversation on empowerment rather than suffering? Well, I think um, knowledge um, knowledge is power. I know that's like a cliche, but but knowledge is very powerful. Um, and I don't think there's a better way to empower students than to tell them the truth and make them aware of um, of the realities, um, so that they they can pay attention to these things and not um, perpetuate the um, at least the negative um, aspects of the the systems. And perhaps that knowledge will allow them to, you know, like you had traced as they are growing older to see themselves in these professions and to really 
know that they can pursue um, careers in these fields um, if they are passionate about it and not to be sort of stopped by um, the system or the preconceptions of the system. Right, absolutely. They should be supported, encouraged, um, and um, told that they shouldn't let anything um, stop them. Don't let anything deter them. Um, if it's if it's something negative or it seems like um, you know there are barriers, use that. Use them as as stepping stools to just move forward. Very important. Um, so, questions about the vaccine, which I know um, your research is not on the vaccine, but people are obviously it's on the top of everyone's minds. Just you know, do you have any thoughts about how we can ensure that just the general, the public in general is educated about the vaccine when, when it does become available um, so that people are not afraid to, to take it? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I, so I think I, in my opinion, I, I believe like that the, the science behind the, the vaccine designs is, is pretty, is solid. And so uh, for that reason, I don't think that um, people should worry. Um, but how it might affect them, how it might affect different people, now that's a different story. Um, and I think the only way that we can um, get, get past the, um, people, um, their, maybe their mistrust or anxiety, um, is to be trans completely transparent and to be honest and give, and give as much information as possible Knowledge is power, right? Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay, next question. Would you want admissions offices to consider someone's diversity as valuable as academic performance and experience? Certain programs at this person's college are all white. So any thoughts on how to make sure that these programs are diverse and everyone has the same opportunities to, to pursue these careers? Absolutely. I think that diversity is like um, up there with, uh, you know, your academic um, academic records, because um, consider consider that there may be only, um, you know, everyone may have the same perspective. And when you're lacking diversity of, of perspectives, you you miss a lot. Um, just like I showed a, a map of Boston. Um, there are people who don't even know that those communities exist. I do though, um, and so I can contribute a lot from 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 a unique perspective that other people, um, you know, may not be able to contribute. So I think that diversity is extremely important. Um, do you have any advice for folks in non-STEM fields to aid in public health advocacy for underserved communities? Yeah, I think um, the best thing to do would. Um, be to, to partner if especially if you're um, if people are active in their communities um, I mean you don't have to be a public health expert to know what your community needs um, and so if you if you know what the community needs you can partner with these public health experts scientists or, who, or whomever um, so you can give voice um, to these communities and um, they can participate these communities can participate in solving their own issues or, or addressing their own um, problems. And sort of spawning off of that question, how can we support aspiring and current black scientists and researchers? <laughs> That's another symposium, right? <laughs> That's another symposium. <laughs> um, you know, I, I feel like pay attention to them because, you know, um, for, for a long time, I felt like I was invisible. And I, I, I would, I just wanted um, to have that support, to have people pushing me forward, um, you know, people, people in power, pushing, pushing me forward. Um, and so I think that, I think that, I think that that's important. Um, I think that even if you if you're not an expert in in stem or you know whatever just support support their dreams you know um don't don't make um don't make them feel like they can they can't possibly um you know achieve the, these goals you know that they can't possibly um you know reach uh, um step into these positions because um you know every everyone is qual you know qualified there's no certain uh race or gender or um you know background that would uh preclude preclude people from um 
being uh, a scientist or, you know, an expert in STEM. All right, next question. Human testing has ethical restrictions and statements have got to be made. How was an unethical study, an unethical treatment like the Tuskegee one allowed? Well, I think um, back then, um, there, the, the, the guidelines um, just weren't in place. Um, and even though people should have known better, <laughs> they just, um, you know, they just, because they could, they did. Um, I think they, they continue to happen because, um, because uh, again, I, 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 I believe that, um, it's important to have, um, um, diverse perspectives because what I might consider, um, to be unethical, um, may be, not be problematic for, uh, you know, another researcher. For example, um, we do um, genomic sequencing, and um, if human um, genomes are sequenced, um, usually they go into a database, and, um, you know, that might, that might seem like it's, you know, there would be no problem with it, but from what I know from some, some studies, law enforcement um, can actually um, access these um, genomic sequences, and they can then use the, these DNA sequences to tie people to crimes that they may or may not have committed. And so, uh, you know, I would automatically say, hey, that's completely unethical, you know, let's figure out a way to, you know, fix this. But someone else might not even see an issue with it. Wow. Okay, another advice question for you. Any advice on how to respond to comments like, you're lucky to be insert minority descriptor since they get into university med school easier you know <laughs> you know i right because because it happened to me i remember talking with my mentor and i was completely devastated you know um and i i remember um my mentor at the time um he said well you know if you want to just show them your trans transcripts you can um, because, you know, I, I was like a straight, you know, student. So he was like, if you want to just show them your transcripts, you can, but you don't need to just ignore, just ignore them, you know, just ignore them because, you know, they, that they're really speaking to, um, you know, their, their own insecurities. So just ignore them. Just ignore them. Well, Adrian, I, th I think that's a, a lovely place to wrap up on. I, I know our audience is just um, incredibly astounded by the importance of, of this presentation tonight. Um, so they're a little quiet in the questions area, but um, we, we thank you so much for being here and taking the time to uh, share with us and to be a part of this. It's been such a joy to collaborate with you. Um, and I look forward to, to future collaborations in, in the near future, I hope. Definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, thank you once again to the, the individuals that made tonight possible, Lee and Niall Albright. Um, it was a joy to be able to produce another year of this symposium. Um, we, we just thank you for your support. We hope you're out there watching and that we can see you soon uh, at the museum. And thank you to everyone uh, who's watching and for spending your Wednesday night with us. Uh, we hope that you will continue to do so all fall long. Check out our website, mos.org slash adults for our upcoming lineup. You can register for tickets and just see everything that's happening here at the Museum for Adults. Uh, but until then, we hope that you stay safe and stay well. And thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Adrian. Bye.